Welcome back to the third part in this series where I see if I can beat Final Fantasy VII using a class system. Last time we caught up with our heroes they were here in Cosmo Canyon where we learnt a little bit about Green and his daddy issues as well as learning some very important things about the world that we live in and the live stream and all of that lovely good stuff. So now it is time for us to do a little bit of grinding for Gil because I want to buy some more HP plus and MP plus materia and you can get that here in Cosmo Canyon. So here I am outside Cosmo Canyon with my lovely boyfriend and f tag <laughs> and we're just beating up these turtles trying to get some money together so that we can feel a bit more powerful. Obviously those turtles did not stand a chance we are way too powerful for them and Bart even leveled up his cover materia which is fab so we go ahead buy the HP plus materia so we can give that to Bart so now he is just better equipped to protecting me and then it's time for Claude to return to his hometown of Nibelheim and what's going on? Everything looks the same, the buildings aren't burnt down, everything feels rather normal. It's almost as if Claude has been gaslighting us this entire time, but surely he wouldn't do that. Claude knows who he is, he knows what's going on, and we're starting to feel a little bit more wary of him, or at least I am, but let's see how this turns out. I can't wait to see how this turns out. <laughs> so I believe the best place to start looking is the Shinra mansion as this is where Sephiroth spent some of his darkest days so it makes sense if we found him here. And the enemies in this area are definitely on the stranger side, I mean this game in general has some of the most wildest <laughs> enemy designs in any of the Final Fantasy games and this guy has to be a personal favourite of mine, there's just something uh, kind of camp about it, it's like Mermaid Man, not the Spongebob Mermaid Man but like more like Aquaman uh, on a hanging axe from the ceiling. Interesting. Why would this be in a house? I don't know. But <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely something. It's very, very camp. I do love the drama of it all. And I do think as bizarre as these enemy designs are, I think it really fits Final Fantasy VII to a T because it is just such a weird game. And the game is all about delusions and reality not being quite what you expect it to be. And I think the enemy designs are kind of like a reflection of that. But you just saw there, that was my super duper powerful team. We are killing it as it goes. And would you bloody believe it? Here he is in the basement of the Shinra mansion in the library where we left him all those years ago. Okay, well, that was rude. I was just trying to explain what's going on. Oh, okay, you're gonna fly away. That's great. I'm just gonna pick up this thing that you threw at me. And he throws the destruct material, which we cannot actually use yet as we do not have Vincent. But fear not, he will be coming very, very shortly. But before that, we have this boss battle against the lost number. And the lost number is a pretty tough boss battle simply because he can transform between two different states, depending on whether you use magic or physical attacks. And we want to use magic against this guy. We want the weaker version, which just so happens to be the magic version. So I'm using a party of Green and Caitlyn. Caitlyn casts Big Guard straight away, and then we are using Green and Claude to cast spells on him. This is like a pretty powerful setup. This is like the most magic heavy it can be at this stage in the game. And it's very, very powerful. The spells are definitely quite overpowered at this moment in time, but I haven't been leveling up my materia as much as I would like to. So Green is missing a lot of the level 2 spells, which is a little bit sad, but that's okay because Claude does a lot of damage with his spells as he has been in our party the entire time. And honestly, Big Guard kind of means that we don't really have to worry too much. And I decided to sort of use Green more as a white mage simply because his damage is just not quite as good as Claude's. And we don't really need as much healing stuff. So that's what he's doing. And then Caitlyn is just there doing bio. Uh, I think this guy is not immune to poison. So that is why I'm using it so often. And it's also just like a non-elemental magical attack. I would love to have bio too, but I have not been using Caitlyn as much as I should have. And she doesn't have it yet. And I'm saying she as if she is a she. I'm aware that it's a man pretending to be a toy. <laughs> this game is bizarre. I've, I know I was just saying it, but it's just reminded me again. Like, what is Kate Sif? Why is this a thing? <laughs> why, 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 why is this the direction that they decided to go in? I guess this is just like a cultural thing that I will never understand. I know that like Japan loves cute like mascots, but I thought, you know, green could have been that. But I guess they wanted something like cheeky and silly to be in this game, and this game is quite silly. But um, it's just so left field and everything this game does is just very left field and just unexpected and weird. 
And I think that's why I love it so much. Uh, I don't love this guy very much. He has a lot of HP. And he's not going down as easy as I would like. But I'm not feeling too scared, to be honest. I get my limit break, Klim Hazard, so you can see that. I always thought it was called Climb Hazard, but I guess it is called Klim Hazard, because there's no B. And like, what is that? What is a Klim Hazard? Also, what is a Climb Hazard? I, I thought it was like, because he stabs his sword in the enemy, and then flies up in the air. It's like he's climbing him with his sword. And it's a bit of a hazard, because his sword is very sharp and will kill you. So it's a Climb Hazard. Um, he is the climb hazard, you know, but it's called climb hazard, uh, <laughs> and we all just like accept that that's what it's called. No one really ever questions it, or I haven't anyway until now. But why is it called climb hazard? Let me know in the comments if you know why it's called climb hazard. Let me know. Uh, finally, he's poisoned and he's gone into his magic state, which is what we wanted. We wanted him to turn red, and turn red, he did. And the reason we wanted him to turn red was because this is just his weaker form. The other form is his physical form, and it's just like a lot stronger than this. It just deals a lot more damage. And we probably would have been fine with Big God, but why take the risk, right? If there's an option for an easy option, I'm gonna take the easy option. As you can see there, we are using Blood Fang, which is one of my favorite limit breaks, and it just so happens to be on one of our mages, which is perfect. And it just allows Green to recover his MP, which is great. You do also absorb HP, which is also nice, but way better is the absorption of the magic points. So, lost number goes down, and we pick up the Odin Materia, but we cannot equip it yet until we get this guy. Hello. And this guy is pretty weird. Meet Vincent. He's like a vampire who lives in a coffin, and has some ties to Sephiroth, and decides to join us for that. But until then, he's gonna do a somersault in the air. For reasons, you know? A lot of people just fly in this game, and nobody really questions it. Uh, that's okay. They're allowed to fly, so we explain to him how we know Sephiroth, because he also happens to know Sephiroth, and he gives us this long backstory about how Sephiroth was created, and it's a nice bit of lore that you would have missed out on if you had not got this character, because Vincent is actually another Optionals character, much like Yuffie, but he offers a bit more than her, he has some ties to the actual story, and he's got a very cool design. I, I do really respond well to this uh, emo vampire aesthetic, but he is also a very dull and bland and boring character at the same time. But that's him, he's gone back to sleep, and uh, we appropriately name him something lovely and magical because he is a lovely magical boy. There's no time to sleep though, as Sparkle Semicolon D must find out what has happened to Sephiroth, as he used to date his birth mother, which isn't Genova, but just another woman called Lucretia. And we'll find out more about that later. But here is Sparkle Semicolon D, and if you can remember, he is our Dark Mage which we kind of made up and it's basically a mage that just specializes in all of the dark arts. Things like Ultima, Comet, Death. Think like Severus Snape but in Final Fantasy. That's sort of how I'm viewing Sparkle Semicolon D and that's why he is the dark mage, you know? <laughs> it makes sense in my head and maybe it makes sense to you but maybe it doesn't and that's okay. We don't need to understand anything really. And he, stereotypically in this game, is not very powerful, and it's for this reason. His limit break is kind of useless. He can transform himself into four different beasts, and they're all quite strong, but you lose control of using Sparkle Semicolon D for the rest of the battle, and that's a problem, because you want to be able to use his spells, you want to be able to use items if you need to, and that power is taken away from you. It's just much more useful to do one solid big chunk of damage and then go back to normal than it is to transform. But here we are inside this cave and we pick up another all material, which is fabulous. So there's an enemy in this area that we are interested in and it's this big dragon. And the reason we are interested in him is because he has an ability we can learn with Caitlyn, which you are seeing on screen now. It is the flamethrower skill and this just deals high leveled fire damage to a single enemy. It's good at this stage in the game, it doesn't last much longer than that. And there is also another ability we can learn soon that is way more powerful than this flamethrower technique. But good to have it, good to have all of the enemy skills whenever we can get our hands on them. And he also has a very cool armor that we would love to steal from him. And it's a golden armor. And this gold armor is much more powerful than any other piece of armor that we have at the moment. So I'm using a party of Goofy and Caitlyn for these reasons. And it takes a while, I believe. So you guys in the comments have told me that the steel mechanics work in terms of your level in comparison to the enemy's level. 
And I don't use Goofy very often, I only really use her when I need to steal stuff, so her level is quite underpowered, especially compared to Clods. And that's why it takes so long for us to steal, but that's okay, that's my fault, I should have been using her more. But I want to use everyone a bit equally, and if I don't need to use Goofy, I don't really see the point, because there are just there's just stuff that she does that other people can do better. You know, the main focal point of Goofy is that she can steal things, and Haste also comes in handy, but to be honest, this game isn't too hard. Haste isn't really necessary. Your ATB fills up rather quickly anyway, and the boost you get from Haste isn't significant enough that it warrants using it. It's definitely handy, but it's not game-breaking like it is in Final Fantasy X. Because in Final Fantasy X, you just get more turns to do stuff, you know? Whereas with the active time battle system, Sometimes the ATB filling up isn't the thing that slows down the fight, but more you selecting what you want to do. Caitlyn as well, I'm trying not to use too much. I do use her for a lot of important battles, but through just like little areas like this where it's getting from A to B, I tend not to use her just because she does a lot of like big powerful spells that just aren't really necessary in your everyday battles. But I will say the everyday battles are definitely ramping up in difficulty. This enemy for example has a very very high defense and HP pool so it's definitely taking a lot longer than a lot of the previous fights which is nice. I do think there is a steady enough curve. I think it's more towards the late game where things get really really easy. But we got the gold armlet and then we go ahead and fight two more of these dragons so that we have a gold armlet for each of our party members. And then it's time for this mini boss against this giant scorpion spider dude with uh, pincers. Quite creepy, quite disturbing, and we're using a party of Caitlyn and Green this time. And of course Claude. Claude is always there, you know, I don't need to say that. And we're casting Bio with Caitlyn because this guy is weak to poison. And poison is very helpful against boss enemies, against your everyday average enemy. Poison just isn't really important. If you're against an enemy that is a boss battle and happens to not be immune to poison, then you should definitely consider getting poison on him because it just ensures that the battle won't take as much time as the damage from poison stacks up very, very quickly. It's almost like having another party member that automatically attacks for you and can't die. So yeah, it, it's quite strong. And as you can see, this final bio here actually gets the poison out on him. So I'm feeling a lot safer now. And we have a very, very strong party member in green as well. This is probably the climax of green strength. From here, he does start to dip a bit more. But at the moment, he can consistently heal us with cure. And the only other person that can do this is Caitlyn and Steve. And Steve is just not worth giving levels to. Let's just say that. I'm saying no more. I'm saying no more. But Caitlyn can also heal us. But White Wind is just not very consistent. It costs a lot of MP. And it is also dependent on our current HP. And that's just like not very reliable. So green is just the dog's bollocks. <laughs> He also has the Blood Fang limit break at the moment, so he can consistently heal his MP back up again. So we can use like big MP draining skills and not feel too bad about it because we know that we can consistently recover it whenever we take too much damage. Love green at this very moment in time. He also just does a lot of good physical damage. He got a weapon from his father Seto in that little cutscene that we had in his backstory. So yeah, green is super strong, but he won't be strong for too long. We're getting towards the peak of his usefulness but just enjoy green while we have him because uh it's just nice to see a furry get what he wants you know what i mean he's he's put in the work he's put in the time and ah this move here trine this is what we wanted to learn it's one of the most powerful of the enemy skills in my opinion because it has a fairly low mp cost and deals damage to all enemies and it's very very good damage too there's a lot of spells like this, such as Aqualung and Magic Breath, but they all cost a lot more, and Trine just feels to be the best, uh, the best bang for your buck. You get the most worth out of it, you know? And you're also now seeing the repercussions of relying on Caitlyn to do all of your healing for you, because White Wind restores HP to all of your allies, based on your current HP. So you can see Caitlyn is at 230 HP, and when she uses White Wind, everybody restores 230 HP. So if Caitlyn is getting bullied like she is in this battle, then it means we cannot consistently heal our other characters when they get bullied. So Caitlyn goes down, but fear not, 
Green throws a Phoenix down at Caitlyn. Not sure why, could have probably just used life, but hey ho. And then we go ahead and use Cure 2. So that's why Caitlyn, although she is very strong, she's not the best. And uh, Green is showing us why sometimes being simple and just using powerful spells is all you need. Yeah, there's nothing that Green can't do at this moment in time. He is just like MVP, best of the best. He's even so helpful as to give an ether to Caitlyn so that she can cast White Wind again. I guess what's good about White Wind though is that it will always heal every character, whereas if you're using Cure and All Materia, you may only get one or two uses out of it. So just showing you where our power level is at with our mages. After the fight, we pick up the counter-attack Materia, which we can immediately equip to Goofy, and then we head off to our next destination, which just so happens to be Rocket Town. And uh, I wonder how it got that name. I, I, I can't think of a single reason why. They would call this place Rocket Town, but here we are. And of course we head straight for the shops where we purchase the barrier and exit materia for Bart and Goofy. While exploring Rocket Town, we come across this lady named Shira and she asks us for our names. I'm Claude. I'm Bard of Avalanche. Name's Goofy. <laughs> she instructs us to go find the captain of the ship so that we can potentially borrow it and find him we do. Sid's theme is just another one of those songs from this game that just hits super, super hard. It's so impactful and grand and epic for what is quite a mid character, hence why I have named him as such. And mid is kind of an asshole, like he's just terrible to his wife, he swears at her, he forces her to make his guests tea and like, I don't know, this dude's got some issues. My boyfriend would never say things like that to me, he only spreads kindness towards me, so uh, I feel very sorry for her. And the game tries to justify his abusive behaviour by sharing with us a cutscene that explains how Shira actually ruined his dreams of going to space, but as you can see from this cutscene, he was an arsehole with her before that even happened. I think he is just like an ass. And uh, he was born abusive and then she crushed his dreams and now he's even more abusive to her. And she kind of just sort of accepts that because she made a mistake. And I don't know, I just get bad vibes from him. But the story goes that they were about to go off into space, but Shira was like, nope, I'm just gonna check the oxygen tanks. And uh, it doesn't matter if I die in here because it's about to explode. She's like, I must check the oxygen tanks. And I do kind of get where mid is coming from. It's like, girl, just get out of there. What are you doing? She's like, I don't mind dying. And it's like, Jesus, obviously he's not going to let you just die. But uh, yeah, he, he puts a stop on the rocket going off and then the rocket can no longer be used. So it is just left sat here in Rocket Town. Kind of makes you wonder what this place was called before Rocket Town. Or I guess the town was built after the rocket was there is what this cutscene is showing us. And uh, it's a very nice cutscene. It's very pretty. So after the failed launch of the rocket, Shinra decided to cut all funding towards the space program, meaning that Mid's dreams of going to space were truly crushed, and Shinra have only ever been taking from Mid ever since, so he's kind of mad at them, and that's just a little bit of his backstory. But back to the main plot now. And we're about to go get the tiny Bronco ship, but Shinra has just arrived and are planning to steal it for themselves, but we ain't having any of it. So we're going to beat up Palmer, who is a recurring character. He works for Shinra and is like one of the higher ups there. And he's very, very goofy. I mean, goofy may be in the party, but like this guy is clearly the, the king of goof. Like, why is he just being very silly, rocking backwards and forwards? like a crazy man. And uh, I don't have a dedicated healer in this party. I'm using Goofy and Bart, but I don't really need one because Palmer's just kind of like whatever. Like if I was going to get a game over from anyone, I don't think it would be from this dancing silly clown. See, when you do clownery, the clown comes back to bite. I'm using Goofy simply because there was a nice uh, piece of armor to steal from him. And then we got that. And then he just sort of like proceeds to shoot us with this like zappy cannon. And I'm just like, dude, why are you so happy? We are like slicing you in half, shooting you in the face, and you're still doing your happy, happy, happy dance. You're like that cat meme that jumps up and down. You know the one? That is you, Palmer. You look ridiculous. <laughs> you're supposed to be, you know, representing an, a company here, the biggest company in the entire world. You literally run the world and you, you, you're doing a silly happy dance. What is that all about? I guess I'd be pretty happy too if uh, I had as much money as this guy probably has. 
and had all the power that he probably has. But um, I don't know, he's also getting severely beaten up. So uh, I don't understand why he doesn't just run away because he, he clearly doesn't stand a chance. The only thing he can do is shoot us and it's having very little effect on us. So uh, yeah, this is just one of those boss battles that it's not designed to be hard. It's just like there. But I wish like they made him do something cool, like transform into a, a beast. And then uh, he does this. Which, uh, I don't know what that is supposed to be, but he's like, Oh no, the, the the ship's going off, I better catch it. Oh dear, I guess I've been defeated. And he pulls a silly face at us, and instead of shooting him in the back, Take a lorry just comes and runs him over. And shove it right up your hairy ah! And that's how Regina George died. With Regina George defeated, our heroes can finally take off on the tiny Bronco and head for the Temple of the Ancients like they had originally planned. So, here we are, flying around the rocket, leaving Rocket Town behind us, and we're like, yay, finally we can explore the skies and be free, the world is about to open up to us once more, but of course things are never that simple in this game, and just as we are about to leave, Rufus is like, uh-uh, don't even think about it honey, and the guard proceeds to shoot us down, hitting our propeller and causing us to crash, but luckily Mid is there, and he decides to hop on with us and, uh, Join us on our adventures. So that's really cool. We uh, eventually end up crash landing here in the ocean. But Mid now has a reason to join us and wants to get vengeance on Shinra for crushing his dreams all those years ago. And he now has the opportunity to do that. He has found his window to get his revenge. And Cloud is that window. Huh? Claude. Sorry. His name is Claude. Claude is the window. What? Claude's the window. Oh. <laughs> Okay. So the only materia we can give Mid at this moment in time is the long range materia, so he can't really do much, but as you can see by his stats, he's very very strong. Stronger than Tofu, but he can't really do anything. He can attack from the back row, and that's about it. As we venture off to the gold saucer to pick up the keystone, I'm going to remind you guys that I actually have a Discord server now that is properly up and running, thanks to my good friend Tantocles who helped me sort out all of the channels. So come and join at the Discord server, the link is in the description. It's good fun, we have a good laugh in there. And it is the best place to get updates on when I'm going live, as well as when new videos will be coming out. So click the link in the description, join the Discord, and while you're at it, hey, why not become a member of the channel as well, where you can also gain exclusive perks such as behind the scenes footage, early access to my videos, as well as access to the private Discord server and private community posts. Again, a link will be in the description if you want to join. No worries if you don't, I won't take it to heart, just you watching this video is enough for me. But if you can lend an extra hand and give a tip or like or a comment or even subscribe, then that would be very much appreciated. So the keystone is actually here in the battle arena, and how the player is supposed to know that, I don't know, you're just supposed to run around the entire world until you find it. Ha ha ha! Entertain me. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting PTSD last time a big dude in Speedos asked me to entertain him. Huh? But, uh, turns out Dio doesn't want any of that. He just wants us to fight in the battle arena and then he will give us the keystone. And it doesn't matter if you win or lose the battle arena, which is very, very good for us because our green materia breaks after the second round and then we get the mini status on us in the third round. So we can't cast any magical spells and we can't deal physical damage. So, this was a complete lost cause, and we go out after the third round. So, uh, hey ho, at least we tried. Maybe one day we will come back and revisit the battle arena. But for now, we can pick up the keystone and then head on over to the hotel where we get a little bit of a refresher on the story, where our heroes are at, what our mission is, and why all the team are with us at this moment in time. It kind of comes at the perfect time because a lot of crazy stuff has happened. We've gained a lot of new characters along the way and our intentions are starting to be a bit blurry, so this just says to the player, hey, Sephiroth is running around causing trouble, and we don't quite understand what for. We know that he is after the promised land, and Steve is the only one who has any sort of knowledge from this and can hear the planet speaking to her. So that is why we are following her lead in going to the Temple of the Ancients 
And we have also been hearing rumours of this black materia, which we fear may be used by Sephiroth to cast Meteor and destroy the planet. So that is why the gang is doing this. It is to try and stop the planet from ending. And because we all have our own issues with the way the world is at the moment, and we're constantly searching for answers to things that just feel unexplainable. Who are these men with all the tattoos on them? Why does Red have one? Why is Sephiroth wanting to destroy the planet? And what does Shinra have to do with all of this. So there's so much mystery still and we're all getting very curious and it feels like we're about to get somewhere in the story where we have a major breakthrough in understanding what the heck is even going on here. Hey Mid, let's go back to our rooms. Wow, I, I never saw that coming. Mid and Sparkle semicolon D. You know, I'm, I'm kind of jealous, not gonna lie to you. I'm jealous that they get to share a room together. But I guess I'll just be going back to my room alone as I do every night. Wishing for something, but uh, never seems to happen, does it? Yo, Claude, you still up? <gasps> is it, it? Is it happening? Is this real? Bart, are, are, are you there? What's wrong? Uh, I was just thinking of g going on a walk. What? Just the the two of us? What's wrong with that? Don't give me no lip. Just come on. Oh my god, he's just so demanding and powerful. Let's go somewhere we can talk. In private. Ah! Oh my goodness. Oh my god! Oh my god! Taking you this long, Bart. Finally, you see the magic that we have for each other. I cannot wait to see how this date turns out. So, um... Do, do you do this often? Do you? Oh, what's that? Wow, that's quite nice. Oh, look at that. All the lights uh, shining up at the moon. Doesn't the moon look good? Um, kiss? No. Kiss? No. Kiss? No. Kiss? No. Kiss? No. Why did he invite me on a date and not say anything? I have no idea what's going on. Oh, what's that? Oh, cool. Look. Chocobos. Did, did, did you see that? That was cool, huh? Kiss? Hey, Spikehead, why do you want to see fireworks with me for? What? You invited me! You invited me on this day, and now you're making- you're gaslighting me! You're literally making it seem like this was my idea, you wanted to come here, and now you're not saying anything, making me feel like I'm the crazy person. You should have asked one of them. You asked me! You asked me on this date, and you know what? I kind of wish I was on a date with one of them. It would have been way more entertaining than sitting on this carriage with you all this time. So, what's next? You're now going to talk about Tofu and Steve and how attractive they are and who you'd rather be with? Do you not think that that might hurt my feelings? Can you not see that my feelings are hurt? And then he asks me who I would go with, and then he assumes I'm going to go on a date with Marlene, his child daughter. Like, what? What? Where did that come from? I literally didn't say anything. You've just started assuming that I want to go on a date with your daughter. Probably because, you know, you've messed up and now you're trying to flip it around and switch it on me and make me feel like I've done something wrong. <sighs> How did it end up like this? I don't want to end the date with Bart saying, shut up to me, but I think, I think it might be over. Bart's going to head back to his room. I'm going to head back to mine. And I think it's time that we all moved on. Sometimes things don't pan out the way you expect them to, and I'll always have the memories that we shared together in the good times, you know? I want to remember the good times, because there were many. But it's time to put this relationship to rest and continue on with our adventure. And then, oh no! Is that Caitlyn with the keystone running away? Oh. Okay, Bart, you can't just walk into me anymore. We need to set some boundaries now that this is over. But it turns out Caitlyn has stolen our keystone and given it back to Shinra. And then this is where we find out who Caitlyn really is. And it's here that it's revealed that Caitlyn is actually a toy that is being controlled by a member of the Turks named Reeve. So he's basically a spy who has been with us to try and get information that he can give back to Shinra. And this is like, whoa, crazy, can't believe that's happened. But for some reason, Caitlyn is still just in our party until the end of time. And they're explaining themselves that they're envious of our way of life and that they didn't want to do what they had to do. And instead of us just pushing Caitlyn off this building and watching them fall to their doom, we decide to keep them around with us. And it's basically because they blackmail us into staying with us. And uh, 
Yeah, Caitlyn is like by far the worst character in this game. There's just like no redeeming qualities about them. You know, they're not a pleasant person to be on. They're not with us for genuine, real reasons. They're, they're a liar, you know? They are just simply a liar. And that's why nobody likes them. You're a liar, and this is why Derek don't like you. We're now heading to the Temple of the Ancients to see what Shinra are up to. And we've gone with a party of Bart, Claude, and Steve. This is the Temple of the Ancients. Uh, no, I think you'll find that's a bridge that you're laying on, not a temple at all. But, uh, the temple is just up ahead. And as soon as we enter, we are greeted with one of the craziest screens in the entire game. I mean, look at this. Like, what on earth is going on here? How are we expected to traverse this insane maze? But luckily I have a walkthrough with me and it tells me where to go. So I ain't gotta worry about that. But this is definitely one of the more trippier areas of the game. And Final Fantasy VII is all about being quite strange and bizarre. I mean, look at this enemy here. Like, what? <laughs> this guy's crotch is a jaguar. What on earth? And why is it in this temple? What's What has he got to do in here? You know, what does he eat? What does he do for fun? In fact, what do most enemies do in this game? And where do they even come from? They never really explain where the fiends of this game actually come from. They just sort of appear and try to kill us. But like, what do they do in their free time? You know, when they're not killing people? What happens if Cloud's party never decided to come into this temple? Would there just be like tons of these guys everywhere? Would they reproduce for forever? I don't know. But um, yeah, this this party is not the strongest. Where It's definitely a much more defensive class. But I know there's some very tough battles in this temple. So I wanted to use a defensive party to make sure that we survived it. I'm willing to forgive Bart for his uh, miscommunications during our previous date. And uh, give him a second chance in uh, this temple to prove himself. Uh, you saw there we also picked up Luck Plus and then we also get the Morph Material, which both can be equipped to Caitlyn, but we don't have Caitlyn in our party at the moment. But don't worry, we will give it to her soon enough. And then after a few more puzzles, we pick up the Ribbon Accessory, which we immediately give to Claude. Since we don't boost any of Claude's stats with the accessories, we're just going to give him the Ribbon. So now he is immune to everything. And then we fall down into this hole on purpose because we want the weapon that's in this chest. But turns out the battle down here is actually pretty tough. I thought it would just be like a random encounter, but being attacked from both sides is proving to be quite difficult. And these guys deal a lot of damage. You just saw 902 damage dealt to Bart, which is absolute madness. And then he goes ahead and does it again. And yeah, Bart goes down, he gets KO'd. And uh, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't slightly amused to see him fall after being so rude to us previously, but um, I'm being the bigger person, I'm not going to say anything to him, I'm just going to allow Steve to get him back up again. And of course, like the silly foolish man he is, he goes down again. And I'm like, damn, these guys are like really, really tough. I did not expect this at all. I um, could have revived him here with Claude, but I was like, you know what? Claude don't want to do that. Claude is not out here reviving Bart. We may be on good speaking terms, but I'm not going to be there to be his helping hand like I used to. You know, he lost that privilege when he did what he did to me, okay? And yes... I am still healing from it. I'm not completely over it. I know I keep talking about it. I will get over it one day, but for now, I just need to, uh, I just need to recover. But, um, Steve is also almost down. Luckily, she survives on 7 HP, which is crazy. But these guys just deal a lot of damage. And, uh, Claude's Klim Hazard, or Climb Hazard, whatever you want to call it, didn't really do all that much to him. And, uh, I thought 1600 would be enough to kill him. Turns out it's not. Bart being the lovely man he is, I feel like he's just trying to make us jealous now. Like he jumped in front of the way for Steve and sacrificed himself. And it's like, yeah, okay, I get it. You're over me too, all right? And then we get a lucky crit from Claude, which kills one of these flying little dragonflies. Thank God for that. So now there's only one of them left. Bart is now back up, but Mr. Dragonfly Dude decides to go for the Southern Cross attack. And I'm like, okay, sure we can survive this. Claude is on full HP, but no, it does 1700 damage, one-shotting Claude at full HP, which is nuts. Like, why are these guys so powerful? We've had more trouble with these Dragonflies than we have with most of the bosses in this game. Yeah, did not expect this at all. I was just walking into this thinking it would just be like any other fight, but luckily we do get through it and we survive to live another day. So now we're learning some more stuff about Meteor or whatever, and I'm just like, hang on a minute. That's a plumb bob. Did, did Final Fantasy VII predict The Sims? That, that, like, there are people praying to a plumb bob. That's crazy. Am I the only one seeing that? 
Like, let's pause about the world ending destruction and Sephiroth and all of that madness. Like, I want to talk about this. Because this is kind of whack. The Sims came out way after Final Fantasy VII did, so... I feel like maybe this was a prediction. Just as our party are about to discover what happens under the covers during Woohoo, we are interrupted by Sephiroth and the ground starts to shake and we're like, oh no, maybe we're gonna fight him, but no, it's just a big red dragon. But he does have a very high HP pool and again, we're using our super defensive party, so this may take a little while, and I start off every fight that has Bart in it by using Barrier, so this just shields us from physical attacks. We don't have M Barrier yet, so we cannot protect against any of his magical spells, but that's okay. And now we're just using Clod to do some magical damage to him, and the damage being dealt is rather weak, and the damage being dealt to us is extremely strong and that was with a barrier up so without that barrier Claude would have definitely gone down like not a chance in hell he would have survived that and he didn't even get his limit break which is a uh, kind of nuts the the limit breaks start to slow down and I found out why it's because as you level up your limit breaks they just become harder to obtain so if I stayed in his level one limit breaks we probably would have had our limit break by now but uh, he's on his level two or three by now so level two, he's on his level two limit break. So that's why it takes longer to charge up. And Steve is still on her level one limit break. So hers charges up really, really quickly, which is nice. We just get a free heal out every time we have Steve's limit break. And when she's got nothing to do, we kind of just sit there and chill, you know? The only magic spells she can cast are healing magic. So if she doesn't need to heal, she can just sit there and look pretty, which um, she is mighty pretty. I will say that, but you know, Bart seems to think so. He's always protecting her. Oh, look at that protects her because he thinks she's pretty and that's fine i mean what, what does steve have that i don't you know can steve's hair defy gravity like mine can i don't think so but i mean it can sort of defy gravity a little bit but like mine is clearly better than hers like look at this spike you know this just happens naturally as well i wake up like this no hair gel nothing this is just me being me uh so back to the fight <laughs> We are doing some damage to the dragon. We have our limit breaks, which is lovely. So it's time to use Klim Hazard once more. And we're using the Nail Bat simply because it is our most damage dealing weapon. But it has no materia slots, but that's fine. We just have an armor that has lots of materia slots in it. So now the red dragon has been defeated and we get some lovely experience points, putting us all at some lovely high levels. And we also level up the all materia, which is very handy. We received the Bahamut Materia from defeating this enemy and we can immediately give that to Bart so he finally has two summon materials. And then as we are figuring out how to get out of the temple, our phone rings. How we have reception in this underground pyramid cave system temple thing. I have no idea, but we do, and it just so happens to be Caitlyn on the phone, and she instructs us to trust her, as she has a way that she can get us out of here. Can we trust Caitlyn in this moment? Will we ever get out of this temple alive? And what does the future hold for Clod and Bart? Will their relationship ever be able to mend itself to at least being civil? Well, you're just gonna have to tune in next week to find out, as this is the end of the episode. Shout out to my Jamly members, Hugo, Robbie Rose, Jury Lynn, Francis Cooldown, and Automatic Jellyfish 853. Also, special shout out to my Super Jams, Panas Pusher, Alexander Lazilla, Soul I, Jack B, N, Persephroth, and Docs Baitso. You guys are all incredible. Love you all very, very dearly. And thank you guys all so, so much for watching. My name has been Jamsack. See you guys next time.